You're about to listen to another inspiring word from House on the Rock Church, the London Lighthouse. For more information and interaction with House on the Rock, please visit our website on hotr.org.uk. Hello friends, we had a phenomenal time in service uh, this morning as we had a prison break. We got our thoughts out of prison. You really don't want to miss uh, this message. Thank you for being on this our official YouTube channel. If you haven't subscribed yet, subscribe right away so that you know whenever it is that we are live or we've dropped something new on the platform. I want to say a big thank you to all those of you that support us to get this great work done. Please continue to do so. The various ways in which you can support us are now showing on the screen. Well, as usual, I'm in a rush to get out of your face so you can be blessed by the message. Looking forward to seeing you after the message. God bless you. I'm reading in the New King James translation of God's word, Psalm 142 and verse 7. Listen to what David says. Bring my soul out of prison that I may praise your name. The righteous shall surround me for you shall deal bountifully with me. Now, I know that some other translations don't put it this way, but I absolutely love the way the New King James translation has put it. And I feel that the New King, King James trans translation is still the hallmark, as much as I look at so many other translations, is the hallmark that stays as close to the original text as possible, in my opinion. I read it again in your hearing, just the first part. Bring my soul out of prison. Tell your neighbor, bring my soul out of prison. Bring my soul out of prison. Whew. You see, John chapter 8 and verse 32 says, and you shall know the truth, and the truth will do what? Make you free. Uh, and, and when you look at that scripture closely, it's actually telling us that the truth is, doesn't set you free. It is really the knowledge of the truth that sets you free. Because if you don't know the truth, then you don't walk in freedom. Uh huh. But even further than that, can I let you know that the knowledge of the truth is only potential freedom? That it is the applied knowledge of the truth that is kinetic, that is real freedom. Are you hearing me what I'm saying? Our pilot text suggests that it is possible for one soul to be in prison. Can I, can I have some gentlemen quickly come and, uh, come, come and help me? I think I need, I need about eight guys. Just, just surround me quickly. Surround me, join hands quickly, quickly. Hallelujah. Uh, our, our text, all the way around, just join hands. Our text says, bring my soul out of prison, suggesting that it is possible for a soul to be in prison. Now, I have a challenge because how can a soul be imprisoned? How do you imprison a soul? How? I, I can understand when you put a human being, Nelson Mandela, whoever, in prison physically, but I thought that the very nature of a soul is that it can't be imprisoned. That even though I'm in a physical prison, my soul can still run free and visit the seven wonders of the world while my body remains in prison. But our text says that it is possible for your soul to be in prison. <laughs> you know, and I found out that the worst prison in the world is not Alcatraz or Rikers Island in the USA or um, Guantanamo Bay in Cuba or what's that prison in Mexico. As bad as those prisons might be, that's not the worst prison in the world. The worst prison is the in the world is the one that you are in and you don't know. You, you, you see, because if you are in prison and you don't know that you are in prison, then you are not going to even be trying to get out of prison. Because as far as you are concerned, you are free, but you are not really free 
because you are in prison. This is the prison of the soul. When your soul is in prison, you are not aware that you are even in prison. You, you know what's, what's even more crazy about this prison? Move with me, guys. Is that, that this prison goes with you wherever you go. Other way. Uh, you, you know, normal prisons, if you left it, you leave it behind. But this prison, you go to the city, it's with you. You go to the village, it's with you. You relocate, it's still with you. Bring my soul out of prison. I, and my heart is burdened this, this Sunday morning because I see many people walking around, going up and down, right and left, from the rural to the urban, from the urban to the ruler. Yet, they're still in prison. Their soul is in prison. Well, I came to break you out of prison. This Sunday morning, I came to cut the bars of iron asunder, to shatter the gates of brass, to, to, to provoke a prison break. The subject of my meditation this Sunday morning is prison break. Getting your thoughts out of prison. Mighty Father, send your anointing that makes preaching, teaching, sharing your truth easy. Let revelation flow freely in this house, unhindered by any demonic force or power. Woo! Great light dispelling darkness. Break us out of prison today, we pray in Jesus' name. And the people shout out aloud, amen. And tell your neighbor, I'm coming out of prison. I'm coming out of prison. I'm coming out of prison. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, you know, somebody's going to struggle a little bit, even with my subject and my title, Prison Break, because they're going to tell me that um, any New Testament believer, New Covenant uh, uh, student will say that, hey, pastor, aren't we already free? So how can you be talking about prison break when we are already out of prison? Aren't we already out of prison? And, and, and Jesus, uh, speaking about the knowledge of truth that we just quoted in John chapter 3 and verse 32, he said the same thing. And his disciples also, like you, replied and said, we are the, Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you then say you will make us free? Because we don't even consider ourselves to be in prison. In other words, they were saying like you, like me, they were saying we are already free. We are already free. Jesus further on answered them and says that, well, if you are still committing sin, then he who commits sin is a slave to sin. For a slave does not abide in the house forever. Oh yeah, but a son does. And then he says something profound. He says that he who the son has set free is free indeed. Do I have any free people under the sound of my voice? Come and shout hallelujah. You are indeed already free. Jesus' mission was to come and to set us free, and he has completed that mission. So he has set us free. So I am free. You are free. We are already free. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3 says, Blessed be God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So he has already blessed us. Not that he's going to bless us. We are already blessed. We are already free. Galatians and chapter 5, verse 1, it says to us, stand fast in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. Not that Christ is going to make us free, that Christ has made us free. Stand in that liberty. Don't let anybody seduce you or entice you to get back into bondage. You are already free. Tell your neighbor you are already free. 
It is a finished work. Uh, I quoted from 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17 to 18 two Sundays ago where I said, therefore, if anyone be in Christ, he's a new creation. All things have passed away. All things have become new and all things are of God who has, not who is going to, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. So God has already reconciled us unto himself through Christ Jesus. Once again, supporting the fact, the truth, that you are already free. Tell your other neighbor, I'm already free, I'm already free. So are you. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. All things have become new, all things have become of God. Hmm. So I'm already free. I'm already free, I'm already free. But how do I reconcile my being already free uh, with the idea of a prison break? How do I reconcile uh, my being already free with the limitations I'm experiencing in my life right now? Oh God, I don't know whether I'm talking to anybody. How do I reconcile my being already free with the pain I feel in my body? How do I reconcile my being already free with the distress that I have in my soul? How do I reconcile that I am already free when I can't do what I want to do when I want to do however I want to do it. And is anybody hearing me what I'm saying? Pastor, I heard you say I'm already free, but my situation and my circumstance seems to contradict that freedom. How do I reconcile my being already free and all things being new and of God when nothing seems to have really changed in my life? How do I reconcile it? How do I, do I come to terms uh, with this wonderful uh, declaration and word? Uh, well, first, uh, it says the lack of knowledge, the lack of, the, the, a lack of knowledge of your freedom uh, will keep you in prison even though you are free. That's what John 8.32 meant when he says, and you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. So it is the knowledge of truth that makes you free. So as long as you are ignorant of the, the truth that you are already free, you will sit in prison even though the doors are open and the chains are off. Are you hearing me what I'm saying? So we start to see that the lack of knowledge is one of the first things that keeps you bound, even though as far as God is concerned, you are already free. Okay, let me go further. Galatians in chapter 4, verse 1 and 2 says, Now I say that the heir... The heir, the, 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 the crown prince uh, is no different uh, from a slave, uh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, 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 even though he's master of all as long as he is a child. But he's under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the father. Oh God. As long as the heir is a child, for all intents and purposes, you cannot differentiate that, that, that heir that's a child from a slave. Oh yes. Ah, Calabosa. A lot of believers are like this. We can't tell any difference between you and the person that is not saved because you are still a child. Even though you are master of all, even though you are already free, as long as you are a child, you can't walk in the true liberty that you have. But when he comes of age, the, the Jewish people call it bar mitzvah. When it comes of age, his inheritance of freedom and authority is de 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 delivered to him. But what denied him uh, this uh, inheritance, this authority before was that he was still a child. And as a child, he thought, he understood, and he spoke as a child. But when he becomes a man, he put 
puts away childish things. He stops to think like a child. He now starts to think like a man. And then the father says, now you can walk in the reality of your freedom. Is anybody hear me what I'm saying this Sunday morning? Now, the other way to reconcile our already being free and yet not experiencing the freedom tangibly in, in, in our lives is the truth that we are actually tripartite beings. We are tripartite beings. Can I have three gentlemen to quickly come and help me? Uh, tripartite beings. Hallelujah. Uh, three gentlemen up behind me right here. Thank you. Amen. One here, one immediately behind me, and one over there. Thank you. God bless you guys. First Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 23 says, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit and your whole soul and your whole body, hallelujah, be preserved blameless at the beginning, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So therefore, listen to this, Yakabosa, you are a spirit. That's the essence of you. You are a spirit uh, who uh, lives in a body and has a soul, all right? Did you get it? Did you get it? This is who you are. You are three in one. You are a trinity. You are tripartite. You are a spirit who lives in a body and has a soul. You see, the, the, the you that God created in his image and his likeness is the spirit you. The you that was formed from the dust of the earth and shaped is the flesh you, the body you. And then what God does in Genesis chapter 2 is that he breathes into uh, the body you, the spirit you, and you became a living soul. So your soul was birthed at the fusion of your spirit and your body. Are you hearing me what I'm saying this Sunday morning? Now, you have to understand these three parts. It is with your spirit that you connect with God. It is with your body, your five senses, that you connect with the world. What is the role of your soul? Your soul is the bridge between the two. Your soul is the bridge between the two. The, your soul is able to receive from your spirit and also able to receive from your body and also able to give to your body. Hallelujah. Oh, my goodness. Now, when man sinned and fell short of glory, God said he would die. Die is separation from God. What was separated from God was his spirit. So, in effect, what happened when man sinned was that his spirit side died, but his soul and his body was still alive. Oh, my goodness. Your, and Jesus remedied that through salvation. So, when you accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, what comes back? back to life uh, is your spirit. Uh, and the, this spirit is now recreated in the image of Christ. Oh, yes. So that's what 2 Corinthians 5, 17 meant when he said, if any man be in Christ, is a new creation. The new creation is not your soul and your body yet. It's your spirit. Your spirit is recreated. It is new. It is of God. All things are of God. That's what's recreated. Hallelujah. But guess what? Your soul is not yet recreated. That's why it says that you have to renew your mind. And your body has not changed. If you were yellow before you got born again, you yellow after you got born again. And if you were black before you got born again, you black after you got born again. If you were white before you got born again, you still white. If your favorite color was orange, your favorite color will still be orange. Does anybody hear me? What I'm saying? Because that's not a function of your spirit. That's a function of your soul and your body. Hallelujah. Somebody give God the praise. Now, you must understand uh, that your soul is actually the most powerful part of you while you are walking upon the face of the earth. Now, I know you want to argue with that because you know that your spirit is so, so powerful, right? And I agree with you. But guess what? Your spirit can do nothing in this natural world but through the gateway of your soul. So this, the gatekeeper is actually the power broker. 
Don't, don't play with gate men. No. Gate men, they can look like they are, they are insignificant. They might not dress like the CEO. They might not drive what the CEO drives. They might not have all the power of the CEO. But if the gate man does not open the gate, you ain't going to see the CEO. Hallelujah. That is your soul. He's the gate man. He has significant power. If you don't deal with this gate man properly, somebody went to see a CEO somewhere. And the CEO blessed him, loaded him, gave him gift, gave him some serious something. The man was leaving. The gate man that opened the gate knew that the CEO had done something. So the, as the man was leaving, he said to the gate man, God bless you. Thank you. And he went his way. Then he was complaining to somebody a few months later, that after I saw that CEO, that they have not allowed me to see the CEO. The CEO, is there, is there, so I complained. The, the guy said, okay, I know the CEO. He's not that type of person. He, he wouldn't not want to see you. I don't know what's going on here. Then he said, what happened when you went to see him? He said, eh, I went to see him. The gate man, eh, I saw the gate man. Eh, when the CEO gave you all of the things he gave you, when you were going back, did you see the gate man? He said, yes, I saw him. I said, mm, did you see the gates man? He said, I don't understand what you're talking about. Did you share any of what you got with the gates man? He said, ah, what, who is the gates man? He said, now you know who the gates man is. That is why you no longer have access. Because you did not take care of the gates man. Your soul is the gates man. Your soul is the arbiter. Your soul is the control. In fact, listen to what Proverbs chapter 23 and verse 7 a says. It says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So your thoughts, your mind, your soul determine your earthly life. Hence, that's where the real battle is. The primary battleground is in your soul. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 to 5. It says that though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are mighty through God. For the pulling down of strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself higher than the knowledge of God. Bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. He who controls your thought life controls your life. Your thought life determines your earthly life. If you, would really, if you really want to change a man, you have to change his thinking. Listen. If you don't change a man's thinking and you change his location, it's just a matter of time when you go and visit that location, that the location will be looking like where you brought him out of. Because he will use his thinking to recreate the same settings. Move a lizard out of one world and put him into another world. He's not going to become an alligator. He will still be a lizard. If you want to change him, you have to change the way he thinks. Easier said than done. Because this is where we all struggle. Whew. If you find yourself in the same type of circumstance over and over again, when are you going to wake up and realize that something needs to change in the way you think? You always blaming everybody else. Oh, is this boss? Is that boss? Is this person? Is that person? Meanwhile, you keep on facing the same type of circumstance. You gotta wake up sometime and realize that the problem is not without, the problem is within. Your life will either rise or fall to the level of your thinking. And guess what? Everyone and everything is fighting for your mind. 
So our key text for this month of transformation has been in Romans in chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. He says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is a reasonable service. So he tells us what to do with our body. But then in verse 2, he says, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is a good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Hallelujah. He's telling you that the only way to avoid being conformed to this world is by being transformed by the renewing of your mind. Are you hearing me what I'm saying? And there's so much pressure in the world right now to conform. So much pressure. I don't know about you, but I, I'm feeling the pressure. Situation, circumstance, pressuring me to conform, to agree to what the world is saying. Uh, in fact, right now, I find that even schools are, are, are trying to, are, what are they trying to teach you? A school of thought. There are schools of thought trying to teach you to think a partic particular way. The miseducation of the masses to get you to believe a certain way, to think a certain way. Pressure to conform, to conform. But God is saying the only way you will not conform is if you are transformed by the renewal of your mind. So we see that the mind is the actual transformation center. It's not just about what you think. It's about how you think. You see, when you accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, your spirit, Ayakabosaba, was transformed. Instantaneously, your spirit is transformed. But guess what? Your soul is not yet. Your soul is being transformed, and your body will be transformed in the final day. Your soul is the gateway through which your transformed spirit gains access to the world. This is why you need a prison break. Oh God, let me explain. Your spirit is already transformed. It's already new. All things are new. All things are of God. And Satan wanted to stop that from happening. But now that he could not stop that from happening, he knows he can't do anything about your spirit. What does he do? He puts pressure on your soul. He tries to make sure I'm going to build a prison around his soul. So even though his spirit is transformed, Transformed, this transformed spirit will never find expression in this world. Are you hearing me what I'm saying? You can go, um, um, brother, Uncle Dakbo. Uh, the spirit is safe. The spirit is secure. The spirit is already saved. The spirit is a new creation. But we now have to deal with the soul. Oh, yes. Let me tell you what. Even before your salvation, Satan was already building and working to build mental walls in your soul. He was already trying to indoctrinate you with certain ways of thinking. He was already sowing seeds of limiting beliefs. He was trying to make sure that even if you got saved, you'll be saved but trapped in a prison of your soul. Are you hearing me what I'm saying? So I'm saved but my soul is still in prison. But God created a way out of this prison, and it is through his word. It's through his word that by the renewal of your mind, hallelujah, by the renewal of your mind, you can break out of prison. I came to declare, I came to proclaim, I came to prophesy a prison break in this house today in the name of Jesus. That invisible prison that you are unaware of, the prison of your very thoughts, it's about to change. It's about to break. You are coming out. If you believe me what I'm saying, come and show yeah. Hallelujah. 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 Buddy, you can go and sit down, buddy. Hallelujah. Uh, we're not dealing with the body today. We're dealing with the soul. Philip, you stay with me, right? Thank you, thank you, thank you. That's the soul. I'll let you go at some point in time, but not quite yet. Amen. Hallelujah. All right, let me let you go. Go sit down. Come on, let's give Philip a round of applause. Amen. 
for your soul is the, is the thing. And the prison break is about breaking your thoughts out of prison. Hmm. In the book of Matthew on chapter 6, severally, we have this phrase, and it says, take no thought. Take no thought what you will eat, what you will drink, what you will wear. Repeatedly, it says, take no thought. Uh, the challenge with that is, for him to say, take no thought, it means it is in my power to take it or not to take it. Hello. Which goes contradistinctive to our general belief system that is, I have no control over my thoughts. It's a lie that the enemy has perpetrated well where people believe I have no control over my thoughts, my thoughts are my thoughts, they just come anyhow, they want to, they just, they just go anyhow, I have no control. Pastor Edward, please, come and take, take a sweet. You see, he had to take it. It's here, but if he doesn't take it, is not taken. I can offer him. I can offer him. But if he doesn't take it, it's not taken. This is what the enemy does. Offering you thoughts. Will you take it? So Jesus says, take no thoughts. I can't stop him from offering it. But I can, I can definitely determine whether I take it. He can offer it, but it's my prerogative whether I take it or I don't take it. I can't stop the bird from flying over my head, but I can definitely stop it from building a nest in my head. Are you hearing me what I'm saying? Tell your neighbor, take no thought. Take, take no thought thought. Take no thought. So thoughts are just suggestions, and it's your choice whether you take the suggestion or you don't take the suggestion. You might not be in control of what thoughts come to you, but listen to this closely. You can determine whether you take them. Let me, let me get more practical. You can control how you think about them. So sometimes you can't deal with the what but you can deal with the how. Somebody says, Pastor, I, I really can't control my thoughts. I, I hear you, it makes sense, but I really struggle. I can't control my, my, my thoughts. Maybe that's because you've been conditioned to think a particular way, and you have never taken out time to deliberately recondition your thinking to think a different way. Think differently. Rethink. Maybe Satan has actually sold us the lie that of not having control over our thinking so that he can continue to keep us in prison at our own uh, uh, agreement because we believe we can't take charge in that area. So the God of this world has blinded the mind of men so that they cannot see, they cannot see uh, what God has done. The battlefield is in your mind. Every, uh, even right now, uh, I break the hold of Satan over minds in this place in the name of Jesus. Even those of you online, I break the hold of the God of this world over your mind. Listen, the whole world, everything in society is fighting for a space in your mind. Space in your mind. Space in your mind. Instagram, look what are they looking for? All of those posts. Space in your mind. Facebook, TikTok, what are they looking for? Space in your mind. Looking for a room. Can we have some real estate in your mind? Because whoever controls your mind controls your life. Now it's time for you to take charge and say, I'm going to be very deliberate about what I allow to stay in my mind. I might be, not be able to stop 
the what, but I can decide on the how. Ay, 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 ay. Is anybody hear me this Sunday morning? Woo! Just like Satan in the world is trying to control your mind, God also wants control of your thought life, if you will allow him. So, my time is gone. Almost gone. It's not gone yet. I have seven minutes, 30 seconds. We have rightly said that Jesus came to change our lives, and I agree. But I've come to find out that Jesus didn't just come to change our lives, he came to change our minds. He came to change our thinking. In the three and a half years that he was working with his disciples, what he was working on was their minds. He was trying to get them to think differently. It was so challenging that even close to the end of his earthly sojourn, he was, he was troubled that after everything I've been telling you for these last three and a half years, you people are still going back to the old way of thinking. Have I been with you so long that you still can't think like I think? There was a movement years ago, what would Jesus do? Beautiful, powerful movement. I'm starting a new movement. What would Jesus think? Because the do comes out of the think. Did you hear me? The do comes out of the think. If you think like he thinks, you would do like he did. If you don't think like he, 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 he thought, then you can't do like he did. He came to change our thought processes. He came to change the way that we think. You thought he was working to change your spouse, to change your house, to change your money, to change your honey, but he was actually working to change your mind, the way that you think. Before you enter into a relationship with anybody, enter into contract with anybody, enter into business with anybody, you must be interested in the way that they think. I want to understand how you think, because that tells me the truth about you, and it tells me the future that we potentially could have together. Philippians 2 says, let this mind be you, it was also in Christ Jesus. The person that says let means that it is within your power to let or not to let, and it's telling you that you can let the mind of Christ rule in your life. I'm picking up my pace, hallelujah. So you, you now have to, to, don't just think like a man, I want you to think like the man, the man Jesus. Whew. How did Jesus think? How did Jesus think? Jesus had a abundance mindset, never a scarcity mindset. The whole world is trying to convince you to conform to scarcity. Jesus never had a scarcity mindset. Every situation he faced, when you interrogate how he thought, you see that this man never thought scarcity. In fact, if there's anything you're going to take out of this message, next time you are reading the Gospels and you are reading Jesus, don't just read what he did. See, what was he thinking? It will open up the scripture. It will, you do, oh my God. So they were in a place and they were supposed to pay tax and they didn't have anything on them to pay the tax with. And the disciples said, hey, we're in trouble. We, we don't have the money to pay the tax. Jesus is in panic because he never thinks lack. He only thinks supply. He said, go fish. The first fish that you catch, open its mouth. There'll be a coin in its mouth. Bring out the coin and pay our taxes. Because sometimes the solution is in fishing. There's always a solution. There's always a way. How do you think? Jesus never thought impossibility. He always thought possibility. 
And he put that same creative power within you. But that power is locked up by your, the prison of your soul. So you have to stop thinking like it can't be done and start thinking, how can it be done? We have a huge mortgage upon this building. Hi. It's terrifying. The world wants you to conform. It can't be paid. No. Change your thinking. How can it be paid? When you interrogate the minds of the greats, you realize that all of them never took no for an answer. They always believe there's a way. It's just a matter for me to ponder, to meditate. That way I will find it. Every time you say no, guess what you've just done? You've shut down your creative forces. You've shut it down. You've shut down your creative forces. But every time you say there is a way, your creative forces on the inside of you continue to work. Guess what? They're even working while you are sleeping. That has been my own personal experience so often. Not all the time, but 90% of the time, I have a serious problem. Guess what I do? I go sleep. People have problems and they can't sleep. Me, I have problems, I go and sleep. Because I'm so confident that the power that is within me will continue to work even when I'm sleeping. And many times I've woken up with the solution. I don't wake up and I, I know what to do. The strategy has come from heaven. I think it's sometimes because my mind is too, is too noisy when I'm awake. Yeah. You know, it's just thinking and just doing all sorts of crazy things. And God said that, it's like Adam, go to sleep. You need to sleep so that, and then I can tell you what I need to tell you. Jesus, no scarcity mindset, abundance mindset. His soul was not in prison. He was supposed to go to Jerusalem, the final journey that we're going to be celebrating in a couple of weeks' time. And he said, we don't have a vehicle. Jesus didn't cry. He didn't panic. He said, oh, we don't have a vehicle. Hey, Jesus. Ah. No. He said, go to a particular house. Tell them that that colt or that donkey that has never been ridden is time. There's always a solution. Sometimes the solution is knowing who to ask. God is going to lead you to who to ask. He's going to lead you to who uh, has that your solution with them. In fact, when I read the scripture, I get the impression that this person kept that ass without knowledge. Because the scripture gives us no indication that Jesus ever told somebody, keep an ass, I'm coming back to use it. It, it, it was just like this guy had a leading, had an impression to just keep the ass. Meanwhile, Jesus sends and says, oh, so that's why I've been keeping this ass since. Somebody has been keeping something for you. And he doesn't even know you yet. He does not even know you yet. He doesn't know who you are. But he's been keeping it. He's been keeping that house. He's been keeping that resource. He's been keeping it. And I, I, every once in a while, he looks and he says, why am I keeping this thing? I should just sell it. Or I should even start to use it. But so they say, no, 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 no. Just keep it. He's keeping it for you. I decree and declare he's keeping it for you. Not many days hence, you are going to meet that person. You are going to make that request, and it's going to be given to you. Best will say, Ah, I've been keeping this thing for such a long time. I didn't know why I was keeping it. Now I know it's for you. If you believe it, shout amen. The way Jesus thinks, never scarcity, only abundance. Even at the beginning of his ministry. 
It comes to the wedding of Canaan. And they run out of wine. Mary comes to him and says, please, solve this problem. Jesus was reluctant. Mary insists. The way Jesus thinks, his mind, his soul out of prison. He didn't start, hey, what are we going to do? What are we gonna do? He says, those six jars, fill them with water. In other words, tell me what you have. Don't tell me what you don't have. I already know you don't have wine. So that's all right. Tell me what you have in abundance. A lot of the time you are overlooking the thing you have in abundance. Is it not water? What is water in the midst of all this problem? Eh? Water. But you have it in abundance. Jesus said, okay, you have water in abundance. Fill those jars to the top, to the brim, with water. Draw out of it. You know the rest of the story. And the water had become wine. I'm speaking prophetic to, to prophetically to somebody this Sunday morning. What do you have in abundance in your life, in your house, in your space, in your arena? What do you have in abundance that you've been overlooking? Water, ah, with just water. Ah, it's, it, it's just this ability. It's just this comp competence. It's just this knowledge. It's just this skill. You, but you have it in abundance. Uh, and Jesus is saying, the way I think is that that thing you have in abundance, guess what? It is convertible. That thing you have in abundance, we can transform it. That thing you have in abundance that you think has no value, we can make it valuable. <laughs> that all of a sudden people are willing to pay money for it. I prophesy transformation. That my God is about to transform things in your life that you thought were of no value. They are about to become of great value by the mighty hand of God in the name of Jesus. The way Jesus thinks. So now he has 5,000 before him and they're hungry. And Jesus says, feed them. The disciples are saying, Jesus, how far now? How are we going to feed 5,000? We are not bakers, we are not cooks, we don't have a supply chain, we don't have logistics. How are we going to feed these people? Jesus again says, what do you have? Yeah, that's it, that's it. When those disciples bought the five loaves and the two fish, I don't think they brought it with faith. They, they are just obeying their master. They brought it and said, see now, see Jesus. It's just five loaves and two fish. In fact, Thomas went as far as to say, how, how, what is this amongst so many? Jesus takes it. The five loaves, the two fishes. He gives thanks the way Jesus thinks. When last did you thank God for what you have that you think is not enough? When last did you have an attitude of gratitude even for the little you have that you think is not enough? He said, my qualifications are not enough. Thank God for the one you do have. He, he, he gave God thanks for the five loaves and the two fish. Then he broke it and he gave it. Stop withholding. The multiplication is in the giving. The world is trying to get you to conform to withholding. That things are hard, they're tough right now. So just withhold. Every little you have, withhold. look, it's not getting more as you are withholding it. In fact, the truth is it's depleting. You might as well give it. And in the giving, it was multiplied such that he fed 5,000 men, not counting the women and the children, and there were 12 baskets full left afterwards. Are you hearing me what I'm saying? The way Jesus thinks, never scarcity, always abundance, 
never impossibility, always possibility. Never there is no way, always there is a way. I can take your little and multiply it. I can make it much. So I came to break your thoughts out of prison. It's a prison break today. I came to unleash creative thoughts within you in the mighty name of Jesus. I came to shine a path that's going to show you that there is a way where there seems to be no way. I came to introduce you to transformative thinking where you renew your mind to agree with the word of God above the word of the world. Woo! Hallelujah! It's a prison break. Hey, you Kabbalah. I came to announce it's a prison break. You're coming out of prison in the mighty name of Jesus. Where others see obstacles, now you will see opportunity. Where others see a casting down, you will see a lifting up. Where others people see an end, you will see a new beginning. Where other people see pain, you will see gain. This is transformative thinking. The, now when you face that situation, rethink. Tell your neighbor, rethink, rethink, rethink. Don't think like the world. Think like Jesus. When you think like Jesus, the impossible is about to become possible. This is transformative thinking. Hallelujah. Place your hands on your head symbolically. Just place your hands upon your head symbolically. Every prison of my soul, every prison of my soul, I break out. I break out. I break out of prison today. I break out of prison today in the name of Jesus. I break out of prison today in the name of Jesus. I think the thoughts of God in the name of Jesus. Creative thought is unleashed within me in the name of Jesus. Ay, 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 ay. Answers, solutions, breakthrough is mine in the name of Jesus. Oh, Bakalia, come on, come on, come on. Pray for yourself. You are trapped in an invisible prison of your thoughts. Now you break out in the name of Jesus. I take no thought. I do not take the thoughts of the world. I take the thoughts of God in the name of Jesus. I think like Jesus thought in the name of Jesus. And a transformative experience is mine in Jesus' name. Radaka Balia Balaboso, Mbidia Balaba Oboboso Tor, Rekelele Balabosa, Rabala Balabosa, Rekelemondo Somba. Yes, Lord, we give you the glory, Lord. We give you the praise, Lord. Rabababababosa Manda, Ekele Belebelebosa, Rekele Belebelebosa. Thank you, Lord. We give you the glory. We give you the praise. We give you the honor. Right now, every yoke, every prison of your soul, I break the bars of iron. I cut the gates of brass. I decree and declare you are set free in the name of Jesus. Creative thoughts are now your portion in the name of Jesus. Every contrary mindset and thought process that has kept you down, I now cast down in the name of Jesus. I release thoughts that lift you up thoughts that show you the way forward and the way out in the name of Jesus I decree and declare that when men say that there is a casting down you shall say 
there is a lifting up in the mighty name of Jesus. Prison break. Come out of prison. You are 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 out of prison. In the mighty name of Jesus. If you believe that, go ahead and give God the praise this Sunday morning. Come on, come on, come on. Give God the praise. Hallelujah. Hello, friends. I trust that you were blessed by that message and you are now broken out of prison. Your thoughts are free to fly like never before. Thank you for being on this channel. If you haven't subscribed yet, subscribe right now. Turn the notifications on so you know whenever it is that we are live or we've dropped something new on the platform. I want to encourage you to support us in getting this good work done. The various ways in which you can give are now showing on the screen. Please choose the pathway that's most preferred by you. Looking forward to seeing you again real soon. God bless you. We hope you've enjoyed this uplifting sermon from House on the Rock Church, the London Lighthouse. We hope you've been informed and inspired. Join us for services every Wednesday and Sunday. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook at HOTR London. Also, live stream our services on YouTube at HOTR London. For more information, visit our website on hotr.org.uk.